What's up? What's going, everybody? God bless you, everybody. I hope everybody's blessed today and is filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to share something with you that I was um, that I shared a message with my uh, church not too long ago, and that was an awesome message. And it's called "Hold the Rope," and I would like to share it with you. And I started this message by asking a question, and the question was: I asked the congregation, "Does anybody have 57 cents?" And it's obvious we all probably have 57 cents. Whether it be under the couch, under our bed, on the floor somewhere, under our car seats. But we have 57 cents somewhere. And we can, and it's safe to know, to say, I mean, it's safe to say that 57 cents is not a lot of money. It's really not a lot of money. You can't really do much other than probably buy a pack of gum or play maybe a game or two or an arcade. Or, it's not really that much. But I want to share with you how 57 cents changed a small church for the better. And it all started with a young little girl named Jenny Smith. See, this young little girl, she was once standing outside a small church from which she had been turned away. She had been turned away because it was too crowded. This young little girl said, I can't go to Sunday school. As she was saying that, the pastor just happened to walk by. He saw her poor appearance and shabby clothes, and he guessed the reason, so he took her by the hand and found her a spot in Sunday school. When Jenny got home and went to bed that night, she kept thinking of the children who had no place to worship Jesus. Two years later, Jenny passed away in her poor rundown apartment in a housing project. Her parents called the kind-hearted pastor and asked for him to handle the final details. As she was taken away, he found a worn and raggedy little purse that she must have gotten out of a dumpster. Inside this purse was 57 cents and a note scribbled in childish handwriting, which read, this is to help build the little church bigger so more children can go to Sunday school. I could stop right there and really preach right there. But there's so much more to talk about. It actually does get better. This story gets better. For two years, she had saved for this offering of love. When the pastor read this, he knew what he had to do. Carrying this note and the little purse he got in the pulpit, he told the story of this unselfish love and devotion. He challenged his deacons to get busy and start raising money for a larger building. But it doesn't end there. A local newspaper caught wind of it. It published a story about this sweet girl. A realtor read the story and offered a large parcel of land. But, but the church could not afford it. When he was told that the church could not pay it, he offered it for 57 cents. Checks started coming in from all over the country. Within five years, Jenny's gift had increased to $250,000, a huge sum of money at that time. Her unselfish love had paid massive dividends. By the way, if you ever get to visit Philadelphia, go to the historic area of Philadelphia, Make sure you stop by a Temple Baptist Church, which now seats 3,300 people. Have a look also at Temple University, where thousands of students are educated and trained. Also go and check out Good Samaritan Hospital and at a Sunday school building which houses hundreds of children so no children will ever be told there's no room. In one of those rooms, you will see the picture of a sweet-faced little girl who's 57 cents made such a remarkable history. Alongside of it, it is, a, it is a portrait of her kind pastor. She was willing to give up all she saved so more kids could come to Sunday school. She was willing to give 57 cents. How willing are you to make a difference in the life of someone? We are called to make a difference. You and I are called to make a difference in the lives of others. There's somebody out there that needs you. There's somebody out there that needs your message, the message that God has placed in your heart. We all have a message. A mentor of mine once said to me, 
very clearly he said to me, Alex, you have a message to speak. Speak that message. I remember I was young and I wanted to preach, but there was, I had difficult figuring out what to preach. But he spoke to me, he told me, you have a message. You have a message and speak on that message. Speak on what you've gone through, where God has taken you out from. We all have a message. We all were called to make a difference in this world. To have purpose. You're not here just to be here. You have purpose in life. Life does have meaning. You just have to find that out. But I want to help you today. Because I want you to know that you can make a difference in somebody's life. Now, one of the things that we need to know is that in order to save people from hell or from destruction, we need to have effective witnessing. Because effective witnessing saves people from hell. Effective witnessing saves people from hell. Now we all may have our different ways of doing things and we all may have our different uh, methods in which we use to witness to people. And if it's working, then praise God, continue doing it. But if it's not, find an effective way to witness, to help people out. In the book of Jude, we are to, in the book of Jude, it tells us that we are to snatch them from the fire. Problem is today that too many people are taking witnessing light, lightly. We are not serious about searching them out. We are not concerned about the outcome of so many. Right now, this very moment, there are people on the road to destruction. And you have the answer. You have the ability to help them and snatch them from destruction and help them in their time of need. But sometimes we're not concerned. We're so filled with ourselves. We're so focused on our own issues and our own problems that we forget why we are called. We forget why we are here. We forget our purpose. We forget our reason for living. We are not serious about witnessing to people. We are not serious about searching people out. We are not concerned about the outcome of so many. Today I want to share with you how you can be the individual or the person or the youth group or ministry that God wants you to be. How can you become a shining light in your schools, among your friends, and in your homes? If you have your Bible, go to the book of Mark, chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. It's an amazing story. I love this story. And most of you have heard the story about these four individuals that help a friend out and, and get try to get them to Jesus. And they eventually accomplish it by opening a hole on the top of a roof and lowering their friend by rope. In this chapter, we're going to meet these four incredible guys who refused to let go of the rope. Four men who made sure their sick friend got to Jesus. That, my friend, is what being a Christian is all about. To go through anything, to get someone to Jesus. Doesn't matter what we have to go through, what obstacle, but that they went through everything in the same way they did. That we must have this same attitude. It doesn't matter what we have to do, what we have to go through. It is our job, it is our duty, it is our passion to, to take those that are in need to Jesus. Now, here in this story, Jesus was preaching in a crowded room, in a crowded house. People have failed this place. There was people in the windows, people in the balconies, people in the doors. You get the picture, right? You literally couldn't get in the door. But these four men were trying to get their friend to Jesus. These men were out of the ordinary. They were out of the ordinary. They are not ordinary people. You are not ordinary people. You are out of the ordinary. You are extraordinary. You are abnormal. You are not normal. These people, these four men, they were remarkable. You see, Jew saw a sick person as someone God was mad at. If a man was suffering, he had sin in his life. Why were these men so moved to get their friend to Jesus? 
The Bible doesn't even give them names, but I believe they had names. And I want to share them with you because we need these four men in our ministry and in our churches, in our youth groups. We need these four men. It's funny how a great story like this is said, but these individuals go nameless. It was important to talk about the story, but their names weren't important. I wish I knew their names. I, I wish I knew who they were. I wish I, there was a record of them so that people knew who these men were. But the importance was not in the individual, but in the action of the individual. You know, sometimes people may not know who we are, people may not ever hear who we are, people may not even get to know who we are. But that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they know us or don't know us. But what does matter is that we leave something behind. And these four men left a legacy behind. They left something behind for us to learn for. for. And I want you to leave something behind. I want you to leave a legacy. I want you to leave a mark in history. Like these four men, they left a mark in history. They don't know their names. We don't know who they are, but we know what they did. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, after you're gone and left this world, will people know what you did? Or will they just know your name? And they know who you are, but they, they never know that you never made an impact in this world. You never impacted nobody's life. You never marked history. I want to encourage you today that you would leave a legacy, that you would leave a mark in history. So let me go right into it and talk to you about the first individual that shows up to the scene the first one was named brother compassion brother compassion this is because he stopped long enough to hurt with this man when was the last time you had compassion for somebody that you stopped long enough to feel someone's hurt that you hurt it with somebody guys that's what compassion is about. To suffer with them, to hurt with them. This man so this man was so concerned, he gave up his front row seat to help this man. He gave he gave up his front row seat to help this hurting man. Maybe he had a need himself, but yet he thought of others before himself. Maybe I understand that maybe you have a need in your life. Maybe you're hurting. Maybe you need somebody. You know what I found out? That, that if we were to refocus our focus, in other words, rather than focusing on us and focusing on others, we have a better way of life. We are happier, we feel more fulfilled in life when we help others. So this brother compassion stops and feels the hurt of this man that's probably on the floor because he's crippled and sick. He gave up his front row seat to help this man. But he put this man before his own emotions and his own feelings and his own needs. He was willing to get a cop, put him on it, and get him to Jesus. He was concerned with his brother. When was the last time you were concerned with your brother? He felt his pain. He hurt with him. The prophet Jeremiah had the same compassion when he cried. Oh, that my head were water and my eyes were a fountain of tears that I might weep for Israel. See, Israel at that time was, was going through some situations and Jeremiah was hurting because he 
felt the pain, he felt the hurt of Israel. Compassions. Compassion at that very moment he stops after he gets him on the cot because he can't move him. See, compassion try to he stopped and hurt with them and he began to try to put them on this cot or stretcher or whatever on bed or whatever you want to call it he placed some on top of this cot and then all of a sudden he begins to try to move him but he realizes that no matter how hard he tried he can't simply move him his friend falls down by his side he falls down by his side sobbing with him wanting to get him to Jesus but he can't do it by himself Friends, we can have all the compassion in the world, but that will not do it by itself. That's why we need the second friend. And this is where the second friend comes in at. His name is Brother Faith. Now, Brother Faith, he is enthusiastic. He says, I know if we can get him to Jesus, he will be healed. So, Brother F Compassion... And Brother Faith take up the cot and try to move him. Brother Faith says, hang on brother, we are going to get you to Jesus. Do you think that we need some more faith in our churches, in our ministries, in our youth groups? The Bible tells us that without faith we cannot please God. You can't be a Christian without faith. It is impossible for you and I to say that we are Christians and not have faith. For our whole belief system is based on faith. And faith alone. It is impossible to please God without faith. Faith sings in the prisons. Faith things when you're locked up when you feel yourself locked up in prison faith continues to sing like Paul and Silas when they were locked up in the prison they were shackled to the wall but their mouths were not their mouths were not shut they began to praise God in the midst of their imprisonment and we know the story the whole prison began to shook the chains fell and broke See, during a pop-up test, faith sings. Faith sings during a storm, during a trial, during a, a test of life. Faith continues to sing and be thankful. See, faith is believing God did something did yesterday and will do it again today. See, faith is believing that if God did it for me yesterday, He will do it for me again today. But what am I... But what I'm seeing here is something we all need in our churches. And it's something that some of us sometimes lack. And it's cooperation. They realize that if they're going to get him to Jesus, they need to do it together. It is only when we draw together, when we cooperate. So many churches out there are competing with one another, fighting with one another don't want to fellowship with one another oh because it's, my church is better than your church your church is not good enough my church is the right church so on and so on but if we were to cooperate if we were to draw together the things that we could do the the masses that we could say we're so worried about our own self and we forget that we can't do this on our own can you see it? Can you can you see them at this very moment? Compassion on one end, crying, faith on the other, screaming, bless God, it will be alright if we can only get him to Jesus. They reach down and try to lift him up, but he just falls off the cot. They can't move him. What are they going to do? What are they going to do now? He still can't move him. All of a sudden, the third fellow comes along and his name is Brother Love. Now, that's an amazing name, Brother Love. You know, imagine him walking down the street and 
shouting his name. Hey, Brother Love, what's up, Brother Love? How you doing? <laughs> By the way, I, I, the Bible says that love never fails. Love never fails. Love is kind. Love is merciful. Love is long-suffering. He suffers for a long period of time. Love endures. All these things that love does, love never fails. You don't need to tricks to get them to Christ. You really don't need activities to lure them in. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having activities or events, but if you just love them, you just show them love. Love. Reach out to them. Show them you care. Show them you love them. Friend, guess what would happen? Guess what happened? When Brother Compassion, Brother Faith, and Brother Love, they begin once again to lift their friend up to try to get him to Jesus. But what? guess what happens? He falls again. He falls again. They simply can't move him. That's when my favorite fellow comes along. My favorite friend comes along. Anyone want to guess who it is? Well, let me tell you. His name is Brother Determination. This guy is determined to get his friend to Jesus. He knew the only way to get his friend better was to get him to Jesus. He knew Jesus could heal him. It was the realization that caused him to be more intense on getting him to Jesus. He was the one with reality. He said, fellows, we got to get him to Jesus. You can cry all you want. You can shout all you want. You can love him all you want. But unless we get him to Jesus, he will not be healed. His intensity caused these four men to do something bizarre. They begin to lift this man up and they begin to take him up on the roof of this house and he began to do something crazy out of ordinary, something abnormal, something that probably you and I would never do or would not think of doing. They take him on top of this roof. They went out of their way to do anything mentally to get him to the healer because this man needed Jesus. They were willing to take a risk. Are you willing to take a risk to save the lost? Are you willing to take a risk to save those that are heading to destruction? What are you willing to do? Because you have to take a risk. You have to do the out of ordinary, the abnormal. You have to do something that's not normal to reach some people out there. Are you willing to take a risk to reach the lost in your schools and communities? Are you willing to go to the extremes to get them to Christ? I want you to imagine the church scene that day when sawdust started to fall from the roof, when the roar of the saw echoed throughout the church. Maybe some church member will be looking in their bulletin for this and probably begin to say, these crazy people are ruining the service. But then they lowered him by rope to Jesus. But these men had their priorities right. Jesus did not even rebuke them. No, he had compassion on them. He wasn't angry because he had been disturbed. He saw their faith and was moved. He was moved. He, he said, they, thy sins be forgiven, you brother. He saw their faith. Four men with who went through plenty of obstacles but that didn't stop them but each one had their reason for helping their friend each one had a reason and a purpose for helping their friend mark chapter 16 verse 15 says go into all the world and preach the good news to all of creation we as believers are to be challenged to go spread the gospel charles spurgeon once said 
Either you are a missionary or an imposter. And which one are you? Are you a Christian or an imposter? Are you a missionary or an imposter? Are you an ambassador or an imposter? An imposter. Which one are you? Do you realize that when you take your last breath, you will never speak to another lost person? Well, unless you're lost and you end up somewhere else. But we must make it priority to reach them. Mark Cahill put it best when he said, It's like we are having a party and everyone gets a hundred a thousand dollars and a new veto. All we have to do is give them an invitation. Give them an invitation. When I stand before God, I don't want any tickets left in my pocket. I don't want any tickets left in my pocket. That's, that's why we need to hold the rope. People out there need us. They need our message. They need to hear the message of the gospel. They need to hear the message of love. It's not enough to have compassion. It's not enough to have faith. It's not enough to have love. It's not enough. We need determination, people. We need all these four individuals in our lives, in our churches, in our ministries, in our youth group, so that we can go and save those who are lost. We need to hold the rope as they held the rope, as they were lowering their friend down to Jesus. We need to hold the rope to our friends, to our family, to our brothers and sisters, to those that are lost, to the unknown, to the homeless, to the prostitute, to the drug addict, to the homosexual, to the lesbian, to the bisexual. We need to hold the rope. To hold the rope for the Mormon, for the Jehovah Witness, for the Catholic. For the Satan, for the Satanic, we need to hold the rope for them. Forget about who they are and what they do and where they're doing. We need to save them. See, somebody asked me about this, and the reality is that right now, yes, they're approving this whole uh, 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 gay marriage thing and and stuff. And somebody asked me, what are your thoughts on gay marriage and and uh, where do you stand? And I I, I kind of made the comment and I said you know what I believe that the reality is that the church is focusing too much on that issue and it's missing out on the true issue see the issue is not about homosexuality that's not the issue the issue is sexual immorality in general because we can be talking about homosexuals and lesbians and gays, but the reality is that some of us deal with fornication and we deal with sexual thoughts and we deal with all these things. Sin is sin. Sexual immorality is sexual immorality. The issue is not homosexuality. The issue is sexual immorality. And I hope nobody gets offended by what I'm talking about right now but it's the truth the church is focusing on issues that are not relevant okay so so they're dealing with homosexuality okay so they approve uh, 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 gay marriages but what we need to do is show the love of God to the homosexual to the lesbian to the to the bisexual we need to show them love to tell them yes that God God loves them God does not accept what we do God does not accept sin but he loves the individual and if Jesus was here today those are the ones that he will be reaching the gay and lesbian the homosexuals and the bisexuals 
and trisexuals and transvestites and whatever you want to call them. You gotta love them, show them love. You gotta hold the rope, people. Do what it is that we need to do to get them saved. Not, not by condemning them, because we get easily stuck in condemning people. No, that's not the way to save people and show them love, but by loving them, by hugging them, by showing them love, by sitting by them and having compassion and having faith and having love and determination. We need all these men in our churches today. We need these men in our youth groups. We need them more than ever. We want to be what God has called us to be. We are ho we are holding the rope to all the lost in our schools. We are holding the rope to all our classmates who need Jesus in their lives, in our communities, in our jobs. Wherever we're at, we are holding the rope. Don't worry about other church groups. We need to have the mindset that we are the only ones holding the rope. God has given you the rope. Are you holding on or are you just letting it go? Are you willing to make a stand for Christ? Are you willing to stand up? Are you willing to speak and not be silent? Are you willing? I was told of a story that was true that happened some time ago at USC. There was a professor there who taught philosophy who was an atheist who taught philosophy he taught one class a semester to prove God did not exist. His students were always afraid to argue. One, because of his intellect, and two, because at the end of every semester he would say, does anyone still believe in Jesus? If so, please stand up. In 20 years of this class, no one ever stood up. They knew he, they knew what he was going to do next. Because if anyone here believes in God, it is a fool, he said. Because if God existed, he could stop this piece of chalk from hitting the ground and breaking. Then he would drop the chalk and watch it shatter on the floor. All the students would do is sit and stare. Most thought God couldn't exist and I'm sure few Christians slipped through but they wouldn't take a stand for God. Well a few years later a freshman had to take his class. He was a devoted Christian. For three months he prayed he would have the strength to stand up no matter what the professor said. He prayed that nothing would sh shatter his faith. Finally the day came when he asked if anyone still believed in Jesus to stand up. The freshman stood up to the total shock of the professor and the students. The professor shouted, You fool! If God existed, then he can stop this piece of shock, chalk from falling and breaking on the floor. I'm sorry I have a bad issue of pronouncing that word. But about, the, about that time, the professor began to drop the chalk. It slipped out of his hands off his shirt cuff onto his pleat then down his pants leg and off his shoe as it rolled to the ground unbroken the professor's jaw dropped as he stared at the chalk he looked up at the freshman then ran out the room the young man then got up before his class of 300 and told of God his love and his son the freshman was willing to take a stand he knew he was holding the rope. Are you holding the rope? Are you holding the rope? I encourage you today, hold the rope. God bless you. I hope this message encouraged you. I hope this message blessed you. And I want to encourage you to continue holding the rope for those that need you out there. God bless you. This is your brother in Christ, Alex Rodriguez, giving you a message of hope, a message of salvation, giving you a word filled with prophetic anointing 
I just want to pray right now for those out there. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray, Father, that you would help us and strengthen us, that you would place compassion, that you would place faith, that you would place love, that you would place determination in our lives so that we can hold the rope for the lost. Lord, right now in this very moment, I want to ask somebody out there that's watching this video that if you are lost out there, if you feel alone and you feel lost and you feel empty and you feel like there's no hope for you, I want to tell you that there is hope. And his name is Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is the only man in history that is recorded that gave his life for you. No one took it. Some people say that he was murdered. Some people say that he was assassinated. Some people say that he was crucified. But he gave his life willingly for you and for me. No one else did that. Confucius didn't do that. Buddha didn't do that. Joseph Smith didn't do that. None of the gods that are out there record an event where they gave their life for you. But Jesus did. He gave his life willingly. He was God. He was the old Messiah. He was the Messiah of the world. And he gave up his kingdom. He gave up everything to come to this world to suffer pain, hurt, and anguish for you and for me. And to die on the cross and shed his blood so that you can have forgiveness, so that you can have life and life more abundantly. So if you've never experienced God in your life and you're looking for God and you don't know how, I want you to pray this prayer with me. And it's very simple. All you have to do is pray this prayer of salvation. All you have to say is, Lord, Jesus, God. The reality is that I don't know if you are real, if you exist or not. But if you do, I want to give you my life. I want to surrender my life to you. And ask you that you would forgive me from all my sins. I repent for my sins. Forgive me for my past, my life, for living in sin all these years. Forgive me. I repent. At this very moment, I give my life to you. I give my life to you. I surrender to you. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me, for my sins. And I believe that he resurrected on the third day. To give me eternal life. I receive Jesus in my heart as my Lord and Savior. And from this day on. I would live to serve, worship, and honor Him. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today. I want to tell you. You are saved. God has saved you. Forgave you forgave your sins doesn't matter what you did he saved you it's that easy it's that simple if you feel it in your heart if you say it genuinely God does it so I want to welcome you into the family of Christ the family of God you are now not just an acquaintance or somebody that's watching me you are now my brother and my sister in Christ God bless you until next time stay true to the Lord Jesus Christ and keep the faith